your truth, find your voice, sing your song. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Power serves you best when you know how to use it. Welcome to episode 15. Today, I have a special treat, something different than I've been doing. Namely, I'm bringing in someone else to tell their story and to demonstrate how reframing can work. Reframing is always a little different for everyone, but it's that human process of heading down that trail of life, feeling like it's not working or not being at peace with your own story, and finding your way around to the aha moment. For me, that reframe, as I shared in episode one, was sitting on the sidewalk in Columbus, Ohio, and having someone else reframe it for me in a way that I could totally get on board with. Stay tuned for Amy Donaldson Brass's story, sports columnist for the Deseret News. Amy Donaldson Brass, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm excited to have you on today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> By way of introduction, I just wanted to let all of the listeners know who you are so that your story becomes that much more meaningful. You started writing, is this right, back your sophomore year, you were the editor of the Snowdrift before um, graduating from Snow. Did, or did you start writing even before that? Well, probably before that, because I got into newspapering. I, I don't know if I, if I told you this, but I have a dyslexia. So mm. I hated school and really struggled, especially with writing and reading. And uh, it was a teacher in high school, in my sophomore year of high school, who said, hey, why don't you come and do newspaper? And I said, why would I want to do more writing? I can't do the writing that's required of me. And he said, yeah, we have free pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of your illustrious writing career. Exactly, exactly. You get to go to things for free, plays, and I was not a kid with money. So, you know, it was, uh, it was access. I got to ask all the rude questions that teenagers don't normally get to ask of their administrations nice yeah so it gave me access and uh and and honestly um it introduced me to a style of writing that i found um a little bit more freeing i know that sounds weird to people who went to j school but it it was uh if you look at traditional english you know writing essays and types of essays uh it was uh, there were a lot less rules in my opinion and you have an editor so i didn't ever get in trouble for making mistakes (laughs) <laughs> that, was, that made my editor happy. They had something to do. So, yeah. So, it just was the beginning, I think, for me of learning that writing, the essence of writing is expressing yourself. Mm. And I don't think I got that from English writing. I think I got that from journalism. So, after you um, were the editor of Snowdrift at Snow College, then yeah. you came up to University of Utah and you worked for the Deseret News and Utah Holiday Magazine and Associated Press. So mm-hmm. that was just while you were in college. After college, you started working for the Deseret News, um, clear back in 91, covering crime and education and eight years at that news desk, right? Covering yeah. education, crime, minority issues, corrections, business, local government, politics. I mean, you have been well versed in journalism especially in the utah area for a long time yeah i think i had the uh the the jack of all trades i like being the jump and run reporter so the general assignment reporter you know Mm. if something's happening we'll send amy and um at first uh, i am i was a kid with a lot of anxiety and i was pretty shy kid so it was the antithesis of what i thought i would be enjoying but because it pushed me in a in that way, it was actually exactly what I came to really love. That there was this huge creative freedom to it as well. You didn't have to know what you were going to do that day because you know fate was going to hand you something awesome or boring or whatever, and it was up to you to to uh, you know make good on it. Life has a way of taking you where you need to go, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's usually like it's introduction through panic you know oh no (laughs) this can't be happening I can't do this (laughs) well Well, what's your title now at the Deseret News Deseret News is one of the top two newspapers in Salt Lake City so you're working for one of the main voices here in the area 
let's tell them a little bit about your story with your daughter. She was born with a heart defect that required open heart surgery, and that moved you working that larger beat into sports work, right? Because the editor would allow you to work from home. Yeah, I actually quit the paper in 1998, and I was going to stay home and write books. I actually never aspired to be a daily newspaper journalist. That was never my, in my plan. <laughs> a persuasive editor at the Associated Press convinced me that I would miss my calling if I didn't give it a try, and, and he was right. And, um, and then in 98, I decided I wanted to try my hand at some different types of writing, and uh, including working on um, a book with a serial killer uh, that I pretty quickly abandoned. Um, but I, I had a, my second daughter during that time that I was, un, you know, not working at the Desert News, I say unemployed, but you're a mom, you're employed, right? <laughs> and so she was born with a congenital heart defect, and she was going to have to have open heart surgery. And back then, we didn't have any other option for healthcare other than um, Cobra, you know, which is was super expensive, and it was going to run out um, when she was about six months old. So I went back to the Deseret News, and my options were to go back to the job I started on, which was night police or go to sports. And the sports editor was an old city desk editor of mine and a really creative, ambitious guy and saw things really outside the box and said, hey, come to sports and we'll do cool, interesting stuff that nobody else is doing and um, you can work from home. So all of it was super attractive. Well, and so this really is the beginning sort of, I wanna say, correct me if I'm wrong, but of your transformation of finding your own voice because you got into this area that's really male dominated. You started predominantly working in the world of sports. What was keeping you from reaching your potential as a journalist and finding your own voice? I mean, tell us that story of transformation, how you, the story you were telling yourself and then how you reframed that. Yeah, I think this is probably, like you said, everybody's story. <clears throat> when you go out into the adult world, that you, you take a job and the job is defined for you. And the people you are trying to please are the people you work for. And so they define it and then you, look, you do what they ask of you in, in hopes of gaining their approval. You get more money that way, you get promoted that way. So you're constantly seeking validation from the people who are defining your job. And so I think often we don't ask ourselves, you know, what, what am I? Like, what, is, what do I want to say? What do I, like you said, journalism is, for most people, you know, translation of other, someone else, telling someone else a story, uh, just conveying facts. Um, one of the interesting things that happened to me because I was in this male-dominated profession was one of my editors uh, came to me and said, you know, we, you can't complain about not having women's voices in the sports section if you're not willing to step up and be a columnist, you know, and, and give us your opinion on things. And, um, and that led to some, some evolution, but that's sort of halfway through the story. So when I was first starting and I kept looking to the editors and what they wanted, I found what was asked of me or what was defined as successful in sports writing um, very unfulfilling. And um, I thought, well, I'm just not good at it. I just, it's not me. I'm not a numbers crunching, you know, stat keeping, you know, I love fantastic, you know, amazing athletic feats, things that nobody else is doing, but I, and great athletic accomplishments. I love the idea that you push your physical body and your mental capabilities to their limit. And that's a lot of what athletics is. But I also think there was this whole section of sports that actually nowadays uh, is covered much better. But 18 years ago, it was in 2000 when I switched to sports, you know, sort of was just emerging because we were really focused on, you know, what's going to happen in the game, what happened in the game, and how are they, how is the team regrouping after the game and who's next? So it was very game-centric coverage, very competition-centric coverage. And I am a very people-centric writer. For me, it's all about, well, there's this new policy. Well, how is that impacting the kids? How does that impact the parents? How does that, what do the athletes think of new rules? Um, so I had a really hard time with the way the job was defined and the way everyone else was operating in sports. And so I had to, and I didn't know that. So you're, I'm looking at this, you know, what is it? It's almost 18 years after the fact, right? Or 17 mm -hmm. years after the fact. But, but I didn't know that. I just was unhappy. And I, and I didn't, I felt like a square peg in a round hole. And I kept asking people, how do you do your job? 
you know, how do you source? What do you, you know, all the journalist things that I'd learned on City and been so happy. I loved journalism. There was nothing about the job I didn't like. And I was completely miserable for a solid year, maybe into a year and a half. And it wasn't until another colleague of mine, Brad Rock, who's a columnist, um, said, you know, stop trying to be, he didn't really say it this directly, it was a little more obtuse, but stop, stop trying to be one of us, stop, just be you. The things you see and the things you tell me are the things that make your voice interesting, your perspective interesting. And that's the stories, the best stories you write are from that perspective, are using those skills, right? So I think had he not said that to me, I would have probably left sports and gone back to news writing because I didn't know that I was defining the job, that I was allowing other people to define the job for me. I thought, well, this job is just not for me. It just doesn't fit my personality. Rather than mm -hmm. saying, I'm in this universe, how can I make it mine? How can I do what I do best? Well, can I even insert here? Because I think the way you said that is beautiful because so often we discount our own voices. You know, we try to say what we hear other people say, or we try to say things the way they're supposed to be said, when in reality, we all have such unique stories and we all have such unique perspective and we all have a voice that's completely different from anyone else's. And one of the things that I think we struggle with in stories and in life is coming to this place of ultimate self-love and self-trust in our own story. That you know, That's what love your story is about, is saying, my story is okay just the way it is. And, my, and part of that yeah. is your voice. I run into this all the time as a journalist, all the time, where I'll say, you know, I'll be looking for a good story, and people are like, well, my story is not interesting. Exactly what you just said applies to 90% of the best stories I've ever written. Mm. <laughs> when I first talk to the people, they say, well, you should write about so-and-so because he's a fantastic basketball player, or Joe is our team captain and he's the guy you got to write about because, you know, he scores the most points. That doesn't, that's not necessarily the worst story, but it's not always the best story. Well, the idea that we all undersell our own stories, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we come back to voice here where even putting this podcast together, there was a lot of work for me of, hey, your voice matters. And it was a lot of internal work of you can tell a story that nobody else can tell. You get to find and trust your voice. And for so many people, that's just an ongoing thing. But I want to reiterate here and with your story even of when you start to trust your voice, you really start to say what you came here to say. And you can't say it by trying to speak in somebody else's voice. You have to come to a place of love and acceptance of your voice. And that's where your transition into living really big happens. Tell us a little bit about that transition of moving into your own voice and really finding that home space? Well, I think it really is dependent on you, who you look for, for validation. The problem with doubting yourself, I think, which is super, like I said, it's every great story I've ever written. The person said, well, you know, this isn't an interesting story, but I'm a blind runner, you know? I mean, so <laughs> it, this happened over and over. I could regale you all day with the best stories that somebody thought were not worth anybody's time, right? Mm -hmm. But when I stopped looking uh, for validation uh, from other people who had to find the job differently than I saw the job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. well, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily say, hey, man, this isn't my voice. I just thought, stop looking to the people who you work for and because they've defined the job in a certain way because it's always been that way, right? So sports right. writers have done it this way forever. This is how we're going to do it. So stop looking to them to define the job and look for what interests you. What do you like to read? What attracts you? I mean, it's basically the first rule of writing, the first rule of journalism. One of them is if it's interesting to you, it's interesting to somebody else. Right. But yeah. we forget that because we're so busy trying to say, hey, the editor in, in sports, the most important beat is the professional sports or the college sports or whatever. There's this hierarchy that we've defined within our organization, wherever you work, and you buy into it as soon as you get hired there and you start scratching and clawing and trying to get earn legitimacy within the organization without ever asking yourself, is this what I see as important? Mm. What do I see as important? Because for me, I don't think that professional sports are the most important athletic competitions. I think recreational and high school sports are the most important, you know, places for competition and growth and, you know, all the interesting things I love about athletics, right? Why? Um, 
because I think there's so much freedom there. So Mm -hmm. when you do something for a job, you know, your primary motive is money, right? So the higher up you go, the more it becomes, you know, your profession. And it's what, when you are doing it recreationally or because you want to raise money for somebody, a friend whose child is suffering with cancer and they have some medical bills, there's all these other reasons. If you want to go out and see if you can run a hundred miles because you're a domestic violence survivor and you just don't know how tough you are. You think if I settled for that situation, then there must be something wrong with me. And the way you're going to prove to yourself that there isn't anything wrong with you is you're going to go out and do something that everyone else thinks is completely insane, right? So there's all these ways in which we challenge ourselves physically. To me, that's, that's what sports is. Competition, rising above, working together, being dedicated long before you ever need to be dedicated, right? Being committed to other people because you just all agreed to be committed. It's sort of a military-like commitment to each other, team sports are. So there's all these themes. And for me, uh, I think it was Howard Cosell that said, sports are just life with the volume turned up. (laughs) That's how I see it. And so for me, the the most interesting stories come from those levels where people are doing it for a reason other than money. So when you started finding your own voice and speaking from that space that felt real, what did you see change personally and within your career? That's the easiest question. I was happy. All Mm -hmm. of a sudden, I went from feeling like a complete outsider to, I will say I've never felt like 100% insider, but all of a sudden I had a confidence and a joy in my work that was missing for a couple of years. And what was the response to your work with, when you started coming in with your own voice? Well, I think it got better. I think my work got exponentially better. And I think that it continues to get better um, because I continue to push myself. I don't think you, you don't look for places in the world that you're comfortable, but you look for places in the world where you feel purposeful, where mm. you feel joyful, where you feel like this is where I was meant to be. And what I discovered really quickly when I stopped trying to make myself into something I wasn't really, when I stopped fighting it, I, I found really quickly that the people I wanted to write about were desperate to be heard. Mm. You know, they needed me to see them. They needed me to tell their stories. That's and, beautiful. Yeah. And they needed me to do it in a way that I wanted to do it, but that I wasn't quite sure anybody wanted me to tell it. So you know what I'm saying? It's like, Once I started writing for them and for the readers and for the people who were going to consume this Mm -hmm. and and the people who needed to hear those stories, because I think one of the beautiful things and maybe human necessities in sharing your story is that we teach each other how to get through hard things, how to overcome obstacles, how to how to persevere. Absolutely. Teaching is one of the main functions of story. Yeah. So so that's the reason we share. Here's an example. My husband gives me a hard time sometimes in a, in a nice way, but, but jokes with me about some of the t- subjects that I tackle are kind of hard and they're really gut wrenching. And they joke, some of the sports writers joke with me about needing a, handker- a box of handkerchiefs to, or Kleenex to read my stories. But the reality is that's life. Like, so I write a story like that, and it's really hard and really sad to write, and it's hard for the people to share that story with me. How much do you let this stranger with a tape recorder uh, into your life and then trust her to go out and tell people your story, right? That's a really mm. massive ask of people that I don't know, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so then we're sharing it with all these people that they don't know, that I don't know, that we have no control over what happens to the story after we tell it. And every single time, what comes back to us is gratitude and love and mm. this acknowledgement that somebody out there was just, I got an email just two days ago from a guy who said, I was looking for a reason to get out of bed and your column was a reason, gave me the reason. Oh, Amy, that's beautiful. But that's what happens when, yeah. you, when we reach out to each other. We're not meant to be, you know, living on an island all bottled up, mm-hmm. right? We're meant to be connected in every way, shape, and form. It's just that our lives are built to keep us from doing that, mm-hmm. you know, the way we work and operate. So tell me about your story. Just as we end here, I want to hear 
you know, what was the story you were telling yourself when you were first in here? And then how did you reframe that? So my story was I have to please the other sports writers. I have to please my editors. And when, when Brad said that to me and it was, you know, at the bottom of a ski slope, we were covering skiing and I was telling them about the personal story of one of the skiers we were covering in the competition. And he said, you always know these like little personal details about people that I find really fascinating. And, and that, and, and then after that is when he said, you know, you got to trust in the way you see things. Don't try to be us. Don't try to be me or, or Dick Harmon or anybody else. You try to be you, you know? And so then from then on, I just kept asking myself if I wanted to do stories or cover events because that was the cool thing to do in sports or if it was because of what my editor asked me to do or it was uh, what a colleague that I admired had done or was it what I wanted to know and really quickly I just got comfortable with what I love is not what every most sports writers want to cover the NBA they want to cover college sports um, they want to you know work their way up the traditional ladder and and that's totally fine because that's where they're comfortable that's what they want to do but i would love to see sports make room for people who don't see um their purpose in the telling of traditional mm. sports stories because so many people are living and growing and evolving and you know suffering in non-traditional sports ways that we would that would help us as human beings to share those stories mm. and so i think once i started asking myself who am I writing for and you know, who's, who's, who's validation do I need? And at first it was, it shifted to the readers and the people I wrote about and, and pretty quickly it shifted to me. At the end of the mm -hmm. day, I just have to be, I have to feel good about the decisions I make, the questions I ask, what I do to people's lives with the attention I give them and who I offer the megaphone to. Because being a journalist, you know, you have a bit of a megaphone, not a huge one, but you know, you have a little bit of one and you, and you are giving some, you're giving, you're lifting somebody up. You're letting them have the opportunity to, to talk into the microphone for a bit. And, and that's, that's what I ask myself. So I don't do it anymore for, I think about readers. I think about the subjects I write about and I think about my editors. I consider those people, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, what do I feel the purpose of a story? And I've come to see stories as almost their own little living things you know not mm -hmm. as people yeah. but but they need to be born and they need to be born in a certain way and they have their own purpose you know absolutely well and those purpose and functions are what we talk about on this podcast all the time there are so many different functions that those stories play but of course if they're never told they they don't get that chance so you do a really wonderful service in a way that's very authentic and beautiful and sharing and bringing things to light i mean words particularly you know with the media there's a lot of power there and i'm really touched by how you do your job and your willingness and your authenticity in doing it so when it comes to your story really it was one person's comment that clicked with you that allowed you to reframe the whole thing and make those changes to be able to come from a perspective that was totally outside where you'd ever been before but it, it made the whole thing different. It started you down a different track, a beautiful, authentic, effective, and fulfilling track. And I think that's the importance of telling people when they move you, of telling mm. people, I, I think what you're doing is really beautiful or helpful mm. or whatever, because had he not said that to me, I don't know, maybe I would have figured it out eventually, but other people have said things along the way, like the editor who came to me and said, you've been critical of us because we don't have women's voices in a column form in our paper. Um, are you willing to step forward and be that person? You know, and I, I think there's, and, and I didn't know if I was, and then I did, and then I hated it. And now I'm not so sure I hate it. And you know, life is, I, I totally agree with Dr. Phil on this. Life is managed. It's not cured. Mm. So you have to, you're constantly evolving. You know, whatever your identity is, I mean, I'm 48 now. It's been different here and there. Um, I just feel at this point I'm as comfortable as I've ever been in my own skin and uh, and that I see and we always say this to kids like we want you to be unique we and then we get punished for being different right mm -hmm. so I think the the reality is if you can hang on to what makes you feel uncomfortable it's eventually gonna be your superpower mm -hmm. yeah my Perfect. ability to 
not care that I'm a square peg in a round hole, which has been my ability since I was a kid, but I haven't always loved it. Two things. And then the other ability is uh, that I didn't ever feel like there was any buffer between me and the world. I felt like I was one of those people who was born without skin. So all my nerves are exposed. Everything hurts me. Everything makes me happy. I respond out of proportion to everything. And I've been told this since I was a child. But what was a huge, um, you know, what I saw as a flaw in myself is now my superpower. That's beautiful. We talk about the superpowers on this podcast all the time and yeah. and using your stories to amplify that superpower, right? Yeah. yeah. So I want to thank you for being here and for being open and vulnerable with your story. I had a request from a listener the other day who wanted to hear about women in business and she's a businesswoman and she was looking for empowering stories from other working women and I said oh I have just the woman <laughs> I don't know about that but Amy no, has I, a great I think story. it's great that you're doing this because I do think there's a huge uh, we look at it storytelling is like man that's for little kids and you know people that society doesn't really it's a it's a bonus you know it's not really a necessary I honestly mm -hmm. think it's really at the very heart of everything we do how you teach how you uh, pass on your history, how you instill le life lessons to people, you know, how you illustrate points. It's all stories. Beautifully well said. Thank you. And what a great space to end on because um, all of that is truth. And, you know, that's what this podcast is about is using stories purposefully. You know, that, that all that power you just talked about, that story does have that power. And when you use them on purpose as tools to teach, to enlighten, to share awe, to lift other people, to, you know, all of those great things you can do when you actually know what you're doing. But unless you stop and pay attention, you don't realize how powerful that story is. It's not just a, a bedtime story, you know, when you have time. Story is life. Life is story. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. We loved having you on and um, keep telling your story. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Have fun out there this week telling your stories and collecting stories from all the interesting people you get to exchange with on a daily basis. Please go to our website, www.loveyourstorypodcast.com, and subscribe to the weekly inspiration, challenge, and pass on a link to this podcast to one of your friends. Just do it. We'll see you next week for episode 16.